Theater Heroes. Today, I'm Amy Dallin. I'm Coach Andro. And we are delighted to welcome today a legendary comic book artist, the illustrator, and co creator of The Boys. Welcome, Derek Robertson. Hi. Hello. How, How you doing, man? I'm good. I am in love with your work. Thank you in advance just as a fan. Like, holy crap, thanks for joining us, man. Well, I'm so happy to be here, and, and I'm a fan of your work, too, Coy. We were talking just before the cameras rolled about I'm really excited what you're doing to elevate the comic book people to the Hollywood level exposure. And thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be a part of this. Thank you. Well, you're thanking us for that, but... Literally, your comic book baby is about to hit Amazon <laughs> yes. and blow everyone's mind. Has been preemptively renewed for a second season. Which is we just mind learned. blowing. Yeah, <laughs> I was so happy they said it at con because I've been walking around like biting my tongue. <laughs> Kripke told me a while back, and he's like, "Don't tell anyone." I'm like, "Okay, I won't." <laughs> refreshing Yay. pages, refreshing, refreshing. Oh, they said it out loud. I can. Yeah, say it I don't even know why. Why is that the convention? They go, "Now we're doing season two. I'm like. <laughs> Weight so, off my shoulders. First of all, can you tell us what's the story of the boys? Okay, it's a in in the boys. Um, I'm not sure how much is visible behind me on camera here. Uh, okay, it's about these guys. Uh, if if the superheroes really existed, they would be uh, in our world. The premise is that they would be horribly corrupted by the power and fame and and corporate greed that infects everything in our real world, including the superheroes. So in the front of everybody's imagination, there are the movies and the action figures and the comic books in this world too, but it's all propaganda. It's all out there to like make you think that they're these wonderful self-sacrificing heroes when behind the scenes they're terrible people and they don't care about anybody but their selves and their bottom line. Doesn't sound like any power, power structure we might oh, relate to sure today at all. Um, so Fiction. Yeah, you know, weird world where powerful people are corrupt. Um, imagine. So, <laughs> so, the, um, so the seven are uh, not only physically powerful, they're also protected by this co corporation called Vought International, which sell their services to cities that they can go and protect, but for price. Mm -hmm. And that's the quiet part. But in what happens, and then back in the day when we were creating the comic, uh, Ennis and I, uh, we, he, he theorized like, you know, you see all these superhero battles where cars are flying and buildings are falling and nobody ever gets hurt. Somebody's grandmother might be under that car and I'm like, wow, that's really true. So we built the comic based on that premise, like somebody needs to hold these uh, people accountable. Can I swear? Like PG-13. Okay, yeah. just yeah, want to make sure. I almost let we an F- We slip a lot. I wanted to let an F-bomb fly <laughs> I <appreciate> there. <laughs> I want to just check and make sure I'm not ruining your broadcast. <laughs> Can I take off my pants? I'm gonna... <laughs> I mean, that's we got a big desk. All right. <laughs> it's my dancing 10 minutes of the day. Um, <laughs> But this is the idea that the, uh, they're, they're terrible people, but somebody needs to hold them accountable. Well, that's where the boys comes in. So the boys are a, a weird team of five people in the comic that work uh, as a black ops organization uh, or black ops part of the uh, CIA and have government authority uh, and Billy Butcher flashes a badge you never see intentionally um, that gives him authority to um, basically patrol, spy on, keep tabs on the superheroes because not only in the comic they could physically take them on, in the show they've tweaked it to where they have to outsmart them, which actually ups the ante for their danger level. Mm -hmm. um, but the in the comic it was the idea that they could take them on and police them. So when you're in trouble, here come the boys, you know, and the female is one of the boys, you know. <laughs> I love that this book felt not only like the real world, but there were reflections of the real world in it. And one of my favorites, I just have to say, Please. and the casting is now reflected. Simon Pegg is the father. Yeah, that was the Huey. happy. <laughs> th th I can finally talk about this. Please, that, that was th the this story. was one of my favorite. Okay, I'm going to take for anybody that doesn't know this story at this point, because Simon Pegg went and told it on James Corden. They held my art up oh. on the Late Late Show, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> they, they held the art up. Thank you. <laughs> Because they never, they, like they, most people think only one person does a comic. They, they go, it's an artist and a writer that work together, but the artist usually gets overlooked. Because well, so, a lot of times that's multiple artists too. Yeah. Sure, and in some ways it, it has taken a long time for some of these stories to make it to the screen. But, is, but the hopefully nice element is that now it's happening in a time where I'd like to think it is becoming more standard to pay attention to the people who make these stories. I still notice that it's Garth Ennis is the boys a lot, mm. and nothing against, you know, I'm, I'm super happy for Garth too. Like, this is... Uh, it's just one of those things where 
you know, when an artist works on a comic and designs everything, we both started with blank paper, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of research and a lot of time spent, you know, developing ideas and some of the ideas that made it to the final are, are were mine originally. Like I wanted to make the female Japanese and Garth changed his mind and agreed with that. So that was wonderful. Like we collaborated. collaboration, yeah. No, we collaborated wonderfully on when we created this book and it was a real labor of love and we had a lot of fun creating this. So to be left out of the final, like, and it's this one person's thing, it always makes you go, but he didn't draw it. He didn't, but, and these costumes look a lot like, so much like the costumes from the comic that, that must I feel designed. amazing. Oh, by it's the way. wonderful. I, I got a, <laughs> I have a lovely photo, which I had planned ahead of, I got to go to set last September and I stood with all of them in costume, but that was like, the most magical day of my life because I came because I was told like don't uh, it was a really intense scene that you'll see in season one and uh, I had met a couple of the actors the day before on set so I hadn't met everybody but uh, Kripke was nervous and he just said hey it's an intense day please hang back as much as possible meeting the creator of the comic might make some of them some of these people nervous so just, I said, no, whatever you need. I was just happy to be there. I'm like Ringo and the Beatles, just happy to be here. <laughs> um, so I'm like, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll hide under a chair and peek if that's what's necessary. <laughs> so no, no, just hang back because it's going to be an intense scene. So I was like, okay, don't talk to the actors. Very, I got it. Hadn't met Anthony yet. And so like, um, but to get to the area where my, I had, they had the little director's chair with my name on oh, it, nice. which was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, everything, everything 10 year old me thought might never happen was like happening. But, uh, so but to get to the little area, um, the, you, to that you sit and sit behind the director and watching a monitor, you had, I had to pass through the hallway where everybody was prepping for the scene, getting made up. So they were all sitting across from each other full costume in their chairs, uh, and I came walking through, and I had met um, somebody I had met the day before. I met Erin the day before, and on a different set, out of costume, and she's like, Derek, and then next thing you know, like, everybody's talking to me, <laughs> and I was like, I was told not to talk to you. <laughs> I felt like I was breaking the rules. They're like, no, no, man, it's good, it's good. And then I saw this lovely picture where they all got, put me in the middle and they all were posing with me. And I was just like, these are my characters, you know, like these are the guys that I <laughs> they're designed. To and, you. and they're all hugging on me. And now they're around and, me. And I did, you know, I'm meeting Anthony in full costume as the Homelander. So to me at that moment, he's just Homelander, you yeah. know? And it then was, the poster they released, looking up at them, gave us all, I think, a oh collective my God, the chills. Uh, chills down our spines. Because we were like, that's the, it's the, they're doing the, it's it, the actual it, picture. It really looks like Mike. I mean, they stayed so true. What was mo most beautiful about walking around on set, too, is that I had never, you know, of course, uh, really been that deeply uh, involved in a shoot before, like, you know, where I'm there on, I was there for three days and they, they couldn't pull me off, you know, they actually <laughs> were super kind and like, can you stay another day? Because we're shooting this thing tomorrow. Oh, I'm like, that's yes. so cool. They were wonderful. And, uh, and so, but what was amazing is seeing it all come together, but you're on these indoor sets with fake sunlight coming in the windows that it starts to feel natural <laughs> and that you forget that you're on a set. So it's kind of like being in a casino where like, there's no time, no time at all. <laughs> and, again, and I'm watching this and I, and because I just love storytelling and the collaborative process, even in the abstract, I was loving seeing like them shoot these scenes over and over and over again. It didn't get wearisome to me. I'm like, why are they going again? And I was able to ask <laughs> like, what was wrong with that? You know, yeah. like, oh, we just like, we we're gonna see if we can get a different intonation. And to watch these professionals uh, change it up just ever so slightly each time until they got it just, just so. Yeah. Really amazing. So, um, which leads me back to Simon Pegg. Yes. Um, it's my mutant power. I can always pick up a thread. I love it. It's back <laughs> in the circle. We're here. We're there. Because I love to teach that skill. Because I, I meander, but I always remember where we start. Um, <laughs> depending on how late in the night at con it is. Uh, <laughs> Saturday, no holds barred. Right, okay. no holds barred. Sorry. Uh, second drink, maybe not. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I meet Simon years ago when I was creating the comic with Garth. Um, it, we had a few years to work on it because we were both busy. And I had to fulfill some uh, contractual obligations, and I was 
finishing up Transmetropolitan. And, and I a was, quick, for those in the audience, we will talk about this later, but Transmetropolitan, <sighs> a legendary work of science fiction, also co-created by Derek, and, and just you. an incredible work. Me Hopefully not mentioning. we'll all be back here discussing that at some point. I'd, I'd be happy to. The yeah. fact that I've not mentioned Hunter S. Thompson at this point in the interview yet is <laughs> its own miracle. We'll get there. Uh, good news, I'll come back. So, um, <laughs> The uh, bad news, I'll come back. Um, <laughs> but Simon is, uh, so Simon was only known, wasn't known at all in the United States at this point. I'm my good friend Gary Widow, who I'm currently uh, creating uh, a series called Oliver for Image Comics. Yes. Uh, Gary Widow is the uh, writer of uh, Star Wars Rogue One. He, co he created the Book of Eli with Denzel Washington. That was his creation and screenplay. So uh, Gary and I are, have been good friends since be before those projects even happened, and we started working on Oliver forever ago. Um, but he had loaned me, uh, this is how long ago, this was uh, VHS tapes. <laughs> if you, for children out there, is how we used to experience media. <laughs> um, they, but he loaned me these tapes of a show called Spaced. Yes. Which I had never seen, but he said, you're going to love this. And so I'm there watching. It's the first thing that Edgar Wright and Nick Frost and Simon Pegg did together, and it's wonderful. And now, luckily, it's on Amazon. You can get it. But for a long time, you could only get bootleg <laughs> tapes. You know, <laughs> people that taped it off TV. That's what I was watching with BBC tapes uh, that he had saved. But I'm watching that while, and I at the same time, like uh, the only character that wasn't coming together in the early sketches uh, for me was Huey. And it was partially because uh, Garth actually has a friend that they call Wee Huey. <laughs> and um, I've met Huey, he's a lovely person, but I'd only met him a handful of times and I didn't have any photographs of him. So while I remembered his personality very well, I couldn't draw him from memory very well. Mm. And it wasn't feeling right. The early sketches of Huey don't look right. And I was trying to figure out like, I can see him in my head, I can feel him at this point, but I don't, he doesn't look right on, he wasn't coming out of my hand the right way. Mm -hmm. He looked too mature, he looked too angry, he looked too, he was bald, but it made him look like he was gonna kick your ass, and Huey shouldn't have a vulnerability, yeah. but he also shouldn't look like a pushover. So I was just trying to get that balance, and I'm watching Spaced, and <laughs> there's this wonderful, funny guy who is an aspiring comic book artist who works at a comic book store. <laughs> And this is Simon Pegg, and I'm like, that's him, that's Huey. So I did a really quick sketch, and I have an interesting picture to show you off camera, but um, I, he looks like, uh, so I, I, I did this rough sketch of him real fast, like I froze the, I paused the, the <laughs> tape, and I drew out a, a bad shot of uh, what I thought Huey would look like if Simon Pegg played him and sent that to Garth. He's like, yeah, that works. He liked it. So that was it. And I didn't think much of it other than then this rumors of this movie, Shaun of the Dead, was getting real popular. <laughs> so I, did, I found some stills online of Shaun of the Dead, and I drew from that. And then we released the cast drawings, like my character creations. I think Bleeding Cool broke the news. And the next thing I know, Simon Pegg is, I'm finding out, like, He's blowing up in the United States because of Shaun of the Dead, and he's in Mission Impossible, and all this stuff is going on at the time. We've already announced the book. He's on the cover. I didn't think he'd ever even see it, you know? But it was, which was really stupid on my part because he, he was, clearly he loves comics. That was so but, and I don't recommend anybody do this again. I really, I really <laughs> drew the one in a million card on this stupid thing, because I might have had to redraw a lot of comics uh, before we released. But luckily, uh, Rich Johnston put us in touch, and I got this lovely email where the subject line was, me, Huey. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote this long apology to him saying, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did. I really just love your work. I thought you were great for the character. I will change it if you want me to. Um, it's not too late. We haven't gone to press with number one yet. Um, and he, he wrote, and the nicest thing goes, no, this is the best thing that's happened to me all day, and I've already jumped through a plate glass window. <laughs> so he said, by all means, I love your work. I love Garth's work. I would love to be in the comic. It's no problem. And I went, <laughs> you were the best. Thank you. And then, uh, but then DC was like, no, that's a problem. He now could sue us. You got, he's got to sign a release and you have to ask him. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm like, send Simon Pegg lawyer papers. I really don't want to. Can we please not? He said it's cool. He said, yeah, but this is DC Warner Brothers. They're like, let's make sure it's cool. Yeah. So I, a universe where he owns DC now. Right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right. Well, I papers. think I think that's where everybody's cold sweats had begun. <laughs> but so I wrote him back and I said, I so sorry. I have to ask you this. And he said, you know what? How little they know us both. It's totally fine. And I sent him the cover art to number four as a thank you. Because oh. it's like the best drawing I had done to him to date. And uh, we've remained good friends uh, since then. And I got, and again, don't draw Simon into your comic. <laughs> think this is going to work out for you. I got very, very lucky. <laughs> but at the same time, uh, so years later, uh, okay, so 2008, um, we get canceled. <laughs> And, uh, and then picked up by Dynamite Entertainment, which has run with the book ever since and been 100% supportive. Um, weird day of my life, I'll tell you another time about waking up ready to ink my hit book and being told there is no hit book anymore. Jesus. But, uh, and not understanding why. Uh, but then I, uh, when we got over to Dynamite, um, I just lost the train of thought that I said I wouldn't oh. do. My mutant power is failing me. <laughs> um, it'll come back in just a second. But we had, because um, then I started thinking about being canceled. Oh, call, Hollywood comes knocking. And uh, Hollywood comes knocking, and then we got optioned in 2008. And I was so excited because it just felt like everything was snowballing in the right direction that, you know, so we, I was under contract with Marvel and just bought a house and was being released from my contract to go work on the boys. So I bought a house, I had two small children, and suddenly no job. Um, so we were cold panic at, the, at first, but then uh, we got optioned for the movie and, and I, we thought this was all gonna happen. So I took a, a trip to New Orleans with my wife to celebrate and we were walking around and I found this little back alley shoe shop um, and they had these ridiculously cool like rock star level boots that I, they were like electric blue with a fleur de lis on the side. And I have a, my only, one of my only tattoos is a fleur de lis because I lived in Italy. So it was, uh, they, they looked like they were just, you know, like that moment where they, like there's not a spotlight on them and there's not <laughs> angels. Mm -hmm. There are no angels singing, but in my mind, that's yeah. how it happened. Fate boots. Yeah. <laughs> Fate boots. That's a good word for them. So I, I, I but I'm like, as I tend to be, I'm like, these are too good for me. <laughs> oh. And so I left the shop, but I couldn't get them out of my head. So um, the next day, I tracked down this shop again, and I tried them on, and I bought them, but I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna wear these on the red carpet when the movie comes out. And I put them in the, not, not until. So I put them in my closet, and then the movie never happened. The year after year went by, it went into turnaround, it kept saying, now they, Adam McKay, who has, I've become friends with, is a wonderful person, uh, was gonna write and direct it before he got all kinds of Oscars. Oof. So we had like the creme de la creme director writer, and for whatever reason, people were just too terrified to do this movie. And uh, my friends Phil Hay and Matt Manfredi had written the, the screenplay, and it was good, but it was kind of a PG-13 script, because that's what they were being directed time, to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Adam came in, it's like, let's rate it R. And, <laughs> and it was great, and I got to see little animatics of like what he wanted. He was doing everything he could to sell this movie, and he just could not get the green light. And so year after year for our family, you know, I'm, I'm a comic book artist, you know, I'm rolling large. <laughs> um, but we're, we're, we're managed to make the bills, and I managed to keep employed. And uh, but you know year after year this thing was I got to the point where I'm like it's never going to happen and I'm hearing stories from a lot of people like eh, this happens I know it just happened to Dave Peterson on Mouse Guard what yeah. was that oh close? god that was beautiful and that, and, and, and why yeah. like uh, why that's not happening and that's just the politics of of this beast because everybody thinks Hollywood is this one thing and it's not it's like it's this random it couldn't be more things Hollywood is the sign on the hill that's it everything <laughs> else is a, lots of people doing a lot of different projects and there are people right now like hey this is getting made when's that getting mm -hmm. made I'm like no it's, it's actually the ants under the hill. Yeah, that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know what I mean? We like, just see the mound, but it's the ants. Yeah, absolutely. It's, 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 it just doesn't work that way. I have no influence on what product Amazon may or may not make. So it's just, yeah. this is just, I'm just happy to be here. I got lucky once. I drew Simon Pegg. He right. So oh, <laughs> that helped. And coming back to that. So um, Simon Pegg, 
uh, we everybody wanted him to be Huey, but as early as 2009, he's like, I'm too old for the role. And he told me this privately, too, as well as he would say it publicly. So I knew he wasn't just being humble. He was really like, eh, I think Huey's more like in his 20s. I'm in my 40s, you know. And so I was like, hey, I, I don't think the, er the character is age specific. I just hope you're in it. And he's like, well, but he had his reservations. So when the TV show got launched yes. and that was all happening, the first thing I I got in there was like, have you spoken to Simon Pegg? And then didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And and then one day I wrote again, because I'm like, have you reached out to Simon Pegg about maybe doing a cameo or something? Yeah. And, he, and Kripke's reply was, he's right here in my office now, don't tell anyone. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah! So big day in the Robertson house where we were like Dude. all like celebrating, because Simon's kindness is a lot of the reason this has always had a good ambassador. He's always spoken well of the thing. So, and then he's Huey's dad, which was he's like my dream come true. Because if you can't be Huey, at least be there with Huey. And then he's been great with Jack. And Jack Quaid, uh, going back to that original drawing I did of him as space, um, when I was drawing Simon, I recently found that drawing and did a side by side with the, what I was tr the, the what I was trying to draw, what I drew. But then when you look to, at Jack Quaid's face next to that drawing, it weirdly looks more like Jack than it wow. does like Simon, that's and that's a complete coincidence. And if you think I'm lying, I have it on my phone. I'll show it to you when we're off that's camera. That's amazing. I do. I want to hear so much more about how this came together, about the show. Yes. I, we're so excited to get out in the world. Uh, I do have to ask though, what about the boots? Now the boots, <laughs> fake boots. So, I. Uh, didn't wear them. They had in my closet for 10 years, and every once in a while I'd catch a glimpse of them and go, what well, might have been, you know. But I brought them with me for the San Diego big premiere, and I was like, I'm just gonna wear them to the party, that's good enough. But then they called me out on the red carpet. And so I got to be on camera with Aaron and Carl and all the, and be a part of things, and I wore those boots on the carpet. Yes! yes. But the craziest thing, was as I'm leaving the door to go onto the red carpet, there's a man in a hat standing there behind the, you know, on the velvet rope side, mm -hmm. uh, having to chat. And I looked and I went, and I walked, and then I went back. I'm like, John Carlo? And he looked at me and went, <gasps> and I go, do you remember me? And he goes, yes! And he goes, because four years before, we were at a convention in New Zealand together, and we went to Hobbiton together. <laughs> And we ended up walking around Hobbiton, hanging out in front of Bilbo Baggins' house, uh, and got to know each other a little bit. He's a lovely person, but we were sharing stories, and he's a good friend of Samuel L. Jackson's. And he was like uh, telling me how he golfs with Sam Jackson, and uh, one of those things that comes up in a friendly conversation, you should come golfing with us sometime. And I was like, I don't uh, golf, anytime. but I would love to. <laughs> I will learn, I'll wear these boots. It's never happened. Um, but I was happy to at least be considered. But what was funny was, is like, we, but we, got, we bonded a little bit. And, um, but in this moment on the red carpet, he says, um, what, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm wondering what you're doing here. But I said, the, um, when, remember when you told me you golf with Sam L. Jackson? And he said, yes. And I said, remember I told you that he, I've been told he's a fan of a comic book that I drew because he told Ryan Lee Woods at Mount, Mount, uh, Golden Apple where he shops mm -hmm. that he really likes the boys. And I think for a brief minute there, in the movie stages, he might have been Mother's Milk. That could just be a rumor because cool. I know we're doing media right now, but um, that's what I heard. But, uh, and, I, and that would have been awesome because he's, he's a pretty amazing Nick Fury. <laughs> but they said, I uh, said, so remember I told you that you know, he likes my comic book and that they had optioned it for a movie because this was four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And he goes, yes. I go, this is that movie. And he went, this is you, this is you. And I said, yeah. And I, and he goes, and he threw his arms around me. He goes, I'm so happy for you. your dream came true. And I was wearing my boots and I told him the story of the boots and I, and he's like, your dream came true, man. And so for the rest of that, and I go, but what are you doing here? He goes, I'm in season two. <laughs> Internet, if you write something, never let it die. Keep persevering, buy the boots, and don't draw Simon Pegg because that one option is taken. But believe in yourself because sometimes this happens. We will definitely have you back on because I got to talk Hunter S. Thompson. So many I got to talk Wolverine. I got to talk all the things. Thank you so very Thank much, you. man. It was a real pleasure. I appreciate it. Can't wait to have you on again. Thank you. Thanks I'll be happy always. to come back anytime. Thank you all. We'll see you next time and stay sweaty. <laughs>